22 men, black victims of Americanism, are waking up. And they're gaining a new political consciousness, becoming politically mature. And as they become, uh, develop this political maturity, they're able to see the recent trends in these uh, political elections. The any minority that has a block of votes that stick together is in a strategic position. Either way you go, that's who gets it. You're, you're in a position to determine who go to the White House and who stay in the doghouse. You're the one who has that power. You, you and I have never seen democracy. All we've seen is hypocrisy. When we open our eyes today and look around America, we see America not through the eyes of someone who has, who has enjoyed the fruits of Americanism. We see America through the eyes of someone who has been the victim of Americanism. We don't see any American dream. We've experienced only the American nightmare. We haven't benefited from America's democracy. We've only suffered from America's hypocrisy. And the generation that's coming up now can see it. And are not afraid to say 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 it. Welcome, welcome, welcome. You are tuned into Black West Chester Presents, the People Before Politics radio show, episode 330. Uh, we stream live every Sunday, 6 to 8 on Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I'd like to welcome everybody to the show. Um, I am AJ Woodson, your host. David K. Jones is not here today. I do have my brother from another Dr. Bob with us. I'll bring him on the screen real quick. First, um, just want to let everybody know, um, got a lot of good feedback from the last issue, the black to black business issue. Still have some copies. If you didn't get a copy or you need the link, um, just uh, uh, hit me at blackwestjust at gmail.com. We'll make that happen. We are now working on our uh, uh, women's Herstory Month uh, issue. We'll be celebrating uh, women in Westchester um, throughout the month and working on that issue now. Uh, deadline to advertise is next, is Friday. I believe Friday is the... Oh, Friday's date is the 11th, yes. Deadline to advertise is Friday the 11th and the issue should come out around Friday the 18th. Uh, without further ado, let me bring in my brother, Dr. Robert Baskerville. How are you doing? AJ, what's happening, man? Good to see you, brother. Good there to be go. the go. audience members tonight. How you doing, my brother? I'm good. I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. So without further ado, <clears throat> we're going to get right into the show. I'm going to let you introduce our guest. So we're, we're going to have two segments tonight. The first segment is going to feature um, attorney Tamika Coverdale. Dr. Bob, a, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? <laughs> um, Bob, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, you can't hear me though. You can hear me now? All right, everyone. So I, since I'm assuming I'm live, you'll forgive us for the technical difficulties. Just a moment ago, uh, things were working properly. Um, so tonight's show is uh, marks the first in our uh, Women's History Month celebration. And to lead off, our first segment is going to be devoted to a discussion of the historic nomination to the Supreme Court of <clears throat> um, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. As everyone probably knows, 
Um, President Biden has <clears throat> made a commitment early on in his campaign that should he be elected and a Supreme Court um, seat open up, that he promised to nominate a black woman. And indeed, uh, with the announcement of the retirement of Justice Breyer, um, Katanji Brown Jackson has now been sub nominated to serve as his successor. So in this segment, what we wanted to do was to talk about the nomination and why it's historic and what um, it signifies for change in judicial court philosophy and uh, rulings here in the United States um, and other things as well. Um, so I hope that it's possible to pull up our guests. I only see myself right now, everyone. Can anyone tell me, maybe even in the chat bar, whether you can hear me? Okay. AJ. Okay, so, so AJ, we are being heard by both our guests, I believe, or both our, or our guests can hear us both. So everyone, what I'm going to ask you guys to do is just hang in, hang on, because we seem to be having technical difficulties. Okay. Hey. <laughs> okay. So forgive me, everyone. So yes, our two guests are now on screen. And as I was saying, it's a pleasure for us to have returning to the show, uh, Tamika Cupdale, who everyone should know as a um, practicing attorney in the city of Mount Vernon. Um, I count Tamika as a friend and can tell you that um, I know in um, previous chapter in her career, she was in private practice, but subsequently, uh, more recently, she's um, gone into public defense. And it's especially fitting that we should have her join us here. Um, in addition, we also have with us Solange uh, Hass Hansen, Solange Hansen, who has come to our attention recently here at um, Black Westchester People Before Politics. Um, through her role with the Progressive Women in Pelham. It's also especially fitting that we should have Solange here on the show. I know that she is herself a practicing and a, a practicing attorney um, who, at least in an earlier chapter of her career, I think served with the ACLU. Um, it's a pleasure to have both of you ladies on the show to kind of help us really, I think, make sense of the significance and import of this election and why it is that um, Black people should be deeply um, concerned and perhaps even supportive of, of um, the nomination of Katanji Brown Jackson, the things that we can anticipate from her and maybe points of concern that you have based on your familiarity with her legal career. But to set up this segment, I've got to begin with a question that um, was posed to me by a close friend earlier today um, that I think is necessary for framing this discussion. And my friend asked me when he found out that I was gonna be on the show tonight uh, discussing this topic, um, asked me, what has the Supreme Court done for me lately? And essentially, um, why should black people care in any way? about the rulings of the Supreme Court. I know it may seem a bit surprising on its face, but nevertheless, um, the workings of the court are often at remove from people's everyday lives. And I am sure that both Solange and Tamika can really drive home for us why this is an important issue for all of us. And so I'll just open up um, the question to the guests and Tamika, I'll start with you perhaps. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I am so happy to be here. It's nice to meet you, um, Solange. It is so very nice to meet you. It's nice seeing you, AJ, and it's nice seeing you, of course, Dr. Bob. I always love coming here and, you know, just, just speaking to our people. 
speaking right. to all of our people. So since we're going to start off with the question that was posed to you, basically, what has the Supreme Court done for us lately? Um, it's been, I can say, I can see how people could think that way uh, because of the balance of the court. When a court is balanced one way and the balance is now tilting conservative, that is why people feel that way. But at the same time, the United States Supreme Court, the highest court in our land, is the final arbiter, okay? We can never forget Brown versus the Board of Education. We can never forget those important cases where Justice Thurgood Marshall, who preceded Judge Katanji Brown, uh, who she viewed as, I can say, someone that she looked up to, he argued so many cases before this court not this court in particular, but the Supreme Court. And at that time, he may have thought, oh, well, the court is conservative. But he only, I believe, and Solange can correct me if I'm wrong, I believe he won every case that he argued except one. Okay? So that is extremely important. And how does this impact us? It impacts us in so many ways. It impacts us in the way that voting rights, and I understand, you know, we're very... It, it, it's an issue right now, our voting rights. Reproductive rights, reproductive rights really impact all of us. And no matter whether you are pro-choice or pro-life, we have to look at the issue, you know, and to say that, well, you know what, these cases should come before the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court should do is basically ban a pro-life. We have to look at the issue. You know, and what should come before the Supreme There's Court? There's a little. And what the Supreme Court should do is come before the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court should do is come before the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court should do is come before the Supreme Court. I read that. Come before the Supreme Court. And what the Supreme Court should do is come before the Supreme Court. Our reproductive rights are so critical. It's playing over and over again. Playing over and over again. It's 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 now everyone is muted so that I can speak. Thank you so much, Solange. So thank you for letting me know it's over and over and over again. But it is so extremely important. And we all must understand that. And I think sometimes what happens, because like you, Dr. Bob, like you, Solange, like you, AJ, we listen to everyone. And people are upset right now, especially people who look like us, because they feel, we feel as if, well, the Supreme Court has not done anything for us lately. And... I know that we come from an extremely strong community and our community has always been steadfast, has always been focused and has never given up, even in spite of everything that has gone on. So I, what I'm encouraging people to do is, even though the bench is conservative right now, there are occasions, and they may be rare, where some of the conservative wing does come around and, and actually listens. So I'm asking that we do that and we never give up hope. Never give up hope even when it seems like there is such an imbalance. But with Judge Katanji Brown Jackson coming on, I think, not I think, I know that she will be in that quote unquote liberal corner, the liberal wing. And even if it's not the majority, dissents, as Solange knows, are so important because what a, a dissent can oftentimes do is later on down the road, that dissent will be used and, you know, people will look at the importance of that. So I will now stop and I will let Solange, my, my co-counsel well, here, answer. What you, what you laid out is, 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 is excellent. And um, I'm just going to add on to that, that although she may be in the minority when she um, is elevated to this court, she will not always be in the minority. This court swings and there's a pendulum in this country where, um, you know, we, we just go to different extremes. And, um, and then there's that nice, you know, space in the middle where we hope that she is going to have a lot of influence. She, um, her, I mean, she's just, what is she, let's see, what has the court done for us lately? I mean, I, I let us list the ways, right? Um, our schools are integrated. Our our um, our water is clean, and we you know we breathe air that is healthy. Um, we have a fighting chance if we're discriminated um, in our jobs in our schools. Um, we are allowed to practice the religion uh, that we feel uh, is critical to to our families. 
I mean, the Supreme Court really is the ultimate arbiter, but it, it also has given us, um, you know, some significant um, clearance on what those rights are. Most recently, the LGBTQ community, and you know, it doesn't really matter, I think, where you fall on that spectrum, but the ability for two people to engage in a meaningful relationship that is sanctioned by their state and allowed to have children or adopt children and reap the same benefits that you know, heterosexuals couples uh, can, can benefit from, that is critical because it's viewed through the lens of, of the civil rights movement where you have to treat each person as an individual and you can't, you can't discriminate based on their relationship. I was born in the year that Loving versus Virginia um, was decided and, and my parents are of, of mixed background. So that case is, was really critical. My parents didn't live in the South, but what if they did, right? Then, you know, why should their marriage in California be valid, whereas their marriage, if they lived in, you know, Virginia wouldn't have been valid. That, that's ridiculous and we would never stand for that. And that's exactly what's taking place on this court right now. It's the, the, the new civil rights type cases that she's gonna have a profound impact on. And make no mistake about it, I have absolutely no doubt we are about to lose our critical right to you know choice over our bodies. It's not going to um, seem like this is gonna be such a huge issue because the right is going to really celebrate that they finally have an abortion case that they can take and, and take away abortion. It's a Pandora's box though. It is going to open up a whole litany of other cases. And mark my words, it's not just gonna be against women. It's gonna be against men. It's gonna be against men you know, that wanna exercise another right, or it's gonna be against families that make that long, you know, that tough decision to, um, to, to end somebody's um, long suffering life. It is going to impact a litany of cases. And that's where we need that voice on this court to represent us. She's a woman, she's a black woman. She's walked in every one of our shoes either your mother's shoes, your sister's shoes, our shoes, she's a lawyer. And, and even in that right, when I went to law school, there were nine black people, period, <laughs> in my law school class. So the fact that she looks like us on the court for, for women lawyers, we're just like, you know, we're in awe and just, that's our dream is to, you know, reach that pinnacle in our career to make a lasting impact on the entire country. That's something very few of us will have the opportunity to say that we did something good of that magnitude. And so say I, think, good, good, okay. good. I think this is really, um, you know, it's a, it's a moment to, to just, I, I cried, <laughs> you know, I knew that it was going to be a black woman, but um, there are so many, women that were being considered that are also, um, you know, they should be next in line for a Supreme Court seat if um, a second seat comes up. Uh, it, it's, it's historic and monumental and it will have a profound impact on our lives going forward. She's 51 years old. She could sit on this court another 40 years. And there aren't that many justices that are currently on the, on the bench that that can say that. Breyer is one of them, but the rest of them on that side are getting up there in years. Right. Now, uh, one way to think about the question that I pose is to sort of reverse it and ask what decisions the Supreme, Supreme Court has recently handed down that are widely uh, perceived to be harmful to the interests of Black folk. And um, here I have in mind such cases as Shelby V. Holder, I think from 2013, which saw a weakening of the pre-clearance requirements for um, the creation of new districts, which is we're in the midst of this redrawing process. And many of us have um, clamored against the way the districts have been redrawn here in Westchester County and throughout New York. I also think of a more recent case, uh, I think the wedding, case cake, uh, the wedding cake case, I think that 
um, has already opened up questions of the civil um, rights of um, the LGBTQI community and raises some very troubling questions about discrimination in the civil commercial um, space. Uh, you know, the Civil Rights Acts of 1865, I think, from the um, after the Reconstruction um, era, one of the things that they did was they banned discrimination against or attempted to ban, I should say, discrimination against uh, Black folk in um, the public setting. Um, so that's another one. And then I, I also thought about the the Janus case, Janus versus uh, AFSCME or the, pu the public union that essentially um, has weakened the ability of unions to uh, mandate um, dues, um, having them automatically checked off instead of um, what is now the case that you have to opt in instead of opting out. So those are some cases that I think of, but I also am curious um, what you think are some of the um, harbingers that we need to be aware of that are on the ad agenda of conservative forces here in the United States that uh, upcoming courts will rule on and are going to impact the um, you know, well-being of Black folk and others? I'll step in. I just wanted to thank um, Solange. Thank you for everything that you stated. One of my sorority sisters is a descendant of, um, she is actually a loving, okay? Oh. So, you know, it's it's so, that case is just so extremely important. And I'm gonna answer your question, Dr. Bob, but I had to touch on what Solange yes. uh, stated because that case was so extremely, extremely important. And every other group, like Solange said, every other group has used that case in their brief when they argue it before the Supreme Court. That is why today our LGBTQ plus I brothers and sisters have been afforded the right to marry. Whether, what side you sit on, but they used that case and they said, it worked here, this is precedent. So now we are going to use that case. So thank you so much, Solange, for bringing that up. Um, I think right now, as Solange stated, and I'm just not going to agree with everything that she says, but when you make a great point, I have to agree with it. Um, and that's reproductive rights are key. Reproductive rights are key. And I think those of us, for example, who are in New York, we don't have to really worry about that. That's what I think a lot of times we think, well, you don't, we don't really have to worry about that because we're protected here in New York. Well, women are protected in New York. So what may happen is that those women whose rights are taken away from other states, they may attempt to come to New York. And I always stated in law school that the ability to um, terminate a pregnancy is a privilege. And the reason why I said that is if you don't have access, it's really not a right. And if you are of low, lower socioeconomic means and Bob knows and AJ knows, the indigent are extremely important to me because they are the least of us. And if you find yourself in a situation where, let's say you were raped, there's incest, you have states for example, the new uh, Governor DeSantis, I believe he just signed into law the 15-week ban, and there is no opt-out or whatever you want to say for incest or rape. It's, it's as if, like, what are people really thinking? So that is major. And in terms of voting rights, when people see that you are winning and the power that you have, that is why they attempt to curtail your voting rights. My grandmother was born in 1911 in rural Delaware. OK, so the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote. And we just have to speak truth to power, gave black men the right to vote. OK, but even if they had the right to vote, they really couldn't vote because every which way they turned was being knocked down. No, you, you are being denied access. You are being denied access. So I, or, I always say we had the 13th Amendment, the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment. And people think, oh, well, we had freedom. No, because you had to have that 1865 Act of Congress, right? With, and that also allowed Blacks to sit on juries, right? But every which way you turn, you were getting knocked down. So really, the Voting Rights Act of, is it 1964, 1965? That's really when we, as a people, were given the opportunity to vote. So when you really think about it, it's 57 years 
I think if my math is right, and I've never been great at math, but I think it's about 57 years, if you want to say that we've actually been quote unquote free. Okay, so I think the two pressing issues are reproductive right. Thank you, Stephanie. Some say 64, some say 65, but I always I like to say 65 as well. Reproductive rights and voting rights are two of the most important. You know, Steph, um, Stacey Abrams is trying to become governor, right? So you keep you keep doing this so that certain people cannot have power. So those to me are two of the most important issues that we are now. You fighting. just reminded me too, where do they pull the jury pools from, right? I mean, think about that for a second, right? They pull them from the voting records and from your ID, your um, when you go to get a driver's license or a state ID. Vehicles, yeah. That's right. And so these, these, you know, the ability to sit on a jury. And, is it, and is it your income tax too? Is it income tax? I don't think you can just, use oh, income tax, no. Okay, no, so no. It's, just, it's just the DMV and, and, right, okay. Right, and so if you reduce the number of people who are eligible or who have access to the ballot, you're also reducing the number of people in your community that you may be able to pull upon to, to sit on a jury. And and I, I don't, I know this isn't about reproductive rights, you know, uh, per se, but it's so critical that we, address this issue of re reproductive rights. There's a there's a lot of philosophy that goes that says, you know, well, what about the instances of rape or what about the instances of, of incest? And, and I really feel like that's really, that's just, that's a, a red herring. It's my body. It's my right. I, I control what happens in my body. And if my body and my person is saying, I don't want to do this right now, I should have the ability to control what I can do in my body. If I don't want surgery, I don't have to have surgery. If I don't want a, a blood transplant, I don't have to wear a blood transplant. If I don't want to have a tooth pulled, I don't have to have a tooth pulled. And, and my reproductive, the ability to control your reproductive system, that is what has really propelled women in so many aspects of their lives. They're not, you know, regard that they don't necessarily have to stay home. They can decide when they want to have children, with whom they want to have children. They can go to school. They can work. I mean, this is such a fundamental issue for us. And and although, you know, we live in New York, I have a daughter that lives in Chicago. I have a daughter that lives in Seattle. I have a daughter that lives in Washington, D.C. You know, our children go other places into this community, and they may or may not live in a state that offers this this right to them. And I I want them to feel and to know they are in control of their reproductive system. And what is about to happen with this Supreme Court is that that right is about to be taken away, a right we held, a fundamental right we held is going to be taken away. And, and some people may not see that, but if I came up to you and I said, I need your right arm, I'm about to take it away, right? Like, People would be like, oh, no, you know, you can't do that. And that's what's about to happen. I, I wanted to say, first off, welcome, everybody. Um, I think I had a little Wi-Fi problem in the beginning and I had to switch cameras and the whole nine. So I'm here. Lovely to see you again, Tamika. Uh, great to meet you, Solange. Did I say your name right, Solange? Yeah, okay. I was on your show before. We talked about the flag. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I, I want to I I say a couple of things that I heard. I heard y'all address a lot of things, so I just want to... First and foremost, and I've been saying this a lot, so this world used to be run by white men. Those are the ones who made the laws. Those are the ones who voted. Those are the ones who executed the laws, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And white men are fearing the browning of America. As you look, Congress is starting not to look like a bunch of old white men no more. You got, you know, your first Indian, uh, Native American, uh, Muslim, uh, um, um, trans. Uh, we have two gay male congressmen that we just put through last year. Um, it, it's starting to look a lot different. You know what I mean? And that scares them. And if, and if you looked at the census this year, the one group of people who did not grow were white people. Asians grew amazing. Uh, Asians grew, Latinos grew a lot, African Americans grew a little, but white people didn't grow. So they're worried about their grasp on their control of that they always had. And it's like, 
you know, it's not like they, they, they're they doing, they realize that they can't win when we vote. When we come out, as we've shown, when we come out in numbers and vote, it hampers their, they, they, they can't win. So now they just want to take away the right to vote. So they don't have that problem no more. I mean, in the Stacey Abrams, I was down in Atlanta visiting my dad and, um, and I was like, yo, this dude that she's running against controls the election. He is, he's, he, he was the head. So he makes the rules in the game he's playing in. And a lot of people in Georgia didn't even realize that. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like he made the rules in the game he was playing in. That, that's, what, what is that? You know what I'm saying? And, and, and it's crazy. So there's, I think voting rights, for me, voting rights is one of the, I keep saying is one of the most important things because no matter what it is you're fighting for, if we lose our voting rights, we'll never get people in there to put in the legislation that concerns us, whether it's women's rights, whether it's in, in, um, healthcare inequality, whether it's um, wage equality, you know, whatever it is that you're fighting for, criminal justice, if we lose the right to vote, we will never be able to do any of those things. So that being said, and the shaping of the court the way our last president um, uh, has moved it in that direction. And you may have already touched upon this because I was in and out. What is the importance, not only of um, this nominee being a first African-American woman, but what is the importance of her being on the Supreme Court right now, especially right now? And if y'all two can speak to that in any order that y'all want to. I think uh, it's extremely, and AJ, um, it's okay that you were in and out. We know how to do it. <laughs> I was trying to do a lot of things behind I the know, scenes there. Yeah. I know, I know, I know. And there, was some um, noise, there was some noise going on in my, in my house, and I had to turn my, my camera off. I know off how it is. Yeah, so. I definitely know how it is. Um, the new normal. Yeah. Yes, the new normal. Uh, it's so important, as we stated earlier, um, and I'll touch upon this and get to your, your answer, but I wasn't, I didn't answer this part. When I found out that Judge Katanji Brown Jackson was going to be the nominee, I know Solange said that she cried. I did the same. And the reason why I, I did that is it is extremely rare um, to one, see a woman, a black woman, like Judge Katanji Brown, meaning she has sister locks. We all know she has sister locks. She is of a certain hue. She has certain features. And she was a public defender at one time. Bob said that yes, he, yes. he mentioned, you know, I actually, I've been practicing 22 years. The, for the majority of my career, I've basically been a public defender. When I was in private private practice, I also did that type of work. And I pride myself on that because as a public defender, you meet people where they are. Oftentimes we are all people have. We are fighting for them. They are at their wits end. And we come in and we understand things that some others don't. Prosecutors, corporate attorneys, and by just Katanji Brown Jackson being on this United States Supreme Court, she brings a different perspective. Now, she was an appellate attorney, public defender in the DC Public Defender's Office, which is extremely important. Clients lost at trial. So now you must go to an appellate court. And she argued 10 cases. And she is, I believe, she, she won nine of the 10 cases. But why is it important to have a public defender? on that bench. Many of the cases that come before the United States Supreme Court are criminal cases. She has sat in the seat as a public defender. Public defender, she was um, on the sentencing commission, extremely important. Her uncle, as many know, was sentenced to life for a nonviolent felony. She asked a firm to take his case pro bono and he got clemency. And why is that important? Well, I know my family and I know many of us who are public defenders. We come from an environment that we haven't all had it easy. We go into this work because we do want people to have a fighting chance. And when you look at that, you say, wow, this is a perspective that has not been on the bench since Justice Thurgood Marshall, my idol, <laughs> my idol. And we need that. 
you not only need diversity of gender, diversity of race, but you need diversity of the practice areas. And that has been lacking on the United States Supreme Court. That is not to say that every case that comes before the court, because remember, you have to be fair and impartial as a judge, but she comes, Judge Katanji Brown Jackson comes with a different perspective that even Justice Sotomayor does not have because Justice Sotomayor was a prosecutor for her career. So that's extremely important. And I don't want people to, to lose that important point about being a public defender and then being elevated to the United States Supreme Court. So to me, um, that that uh, is extremely important. So do you want to go, Solange? I mean, yeah, I was just going to add on to your um, what you were saying is that she has more judicial experience, uh, more more practice experience than four of the current justices, including the last two justices that were confirmed. Um, her record is it it it's it's outstanding. I mean, she has five hundred and six as of last week. She had five hundred and sixty two written opinions. That's astonishing. That is absolutely astonishing. Tamika's been practicing twenty two years. I've been practicing thirty years. I, I don't. I can tell you, I haven't had the opportunity to file. And, and neither one of you look old enough to be have practice in that many years. I'm just going <laughs> to tell you. I'm just, I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> I am great. I am grateful for you know, the opportunity. I worked hard to pass my bar in California. And um, that was a happy day in the Vital family. Uh, that was before I got married. So that was a really happy experience. I'm the first in my family to go to law school. My father immigrated here. So I'm first generation. And, uh, you know, I, but again, I mean, and, and going back to what, what Tamika said, um, you know, she, Judge, you know, Katanji Brown Jackson, she's beautiful. I mean, she is beautiful. She's fly. She's going to make that robe look so amazing, and she is going to make it hers. I dare any of these cases to come up and talk about black hair, <laughs> about, you know, in one of these cases. I want to see whatever she writes on that opinion because it keeps coming up in the schools, particularly in the South. They're, they're targeting our black boys, how they look and what they're wearing and what how their hair is. And and you know, for any any of the criticism that's gonna come up about her hair, her looks, what does that have to do with her brilliance? That's that is what I am gonna go back to. She she has it. I mean, and there's a there's a certain level that we have to we as black women and black Black attorneys have to bring, you, you You know, she went to Harvard undergrad, she went to Harvard Law School. You know, that's not a requirement to sit on the Supreme Court. Just ask, you know, Amy Comey Barrett. And, you know, like that is not a requirement anymore. But she, but she brought it and she has these cases and she's been elevated to different courts in the federal system. And she's represented clients. I mean, she's, she's really, she's, she's done it. And there's this, there's this, this higher level that we all have to really, this mountain that we all feel like we have to climb. You know, when I walk in and I, I don't walk into any situation saying I'm an attorney, you know, I'm just, I'm just lunch. whether it's, you know, I'm talking to my kid's school or whatever, you know, I always notice, uh, you know, or a pediatrician or something, I always notice there's a difference between Mrs. Hansen, the parent. And Mrs. Hanson, they find out I've been practicing law for 30 years and I'm not going to have it. And so she she brings that level of expertise to the bench. And I think she's actually, after the last two you know, confirmations, she's going to professionalize and bring that level, that higher level back to the court. She'll set the bar for the next nominee that comes up behind her, whoever whoever is nominating at that time. And I, I, I admire that, I respect that, I respect this judge, I respect all of the nominees that were under consideration. And you know, I'm I'm 
I'm thrilled. I, you know, I'm going to block off all my time on the TV because I have got to watch every second of everything that she says. I worked in the Senate. I worked for Arlen Specter after that fiasco that that happened with Anita Hill. And, um, you know, and I just I, I, I we got to be on it. We, we have to support our people and um, and really be on it for her. I, I just wanted to say one thing, and then, Bob, um, the hair thing is not just for our sisters. I don't know if y'all know, I used to have dreads. And, you know, when I went from a, I went through that difficult time where I was like getting out of the music business and I got married and I was trying to find a, you know, a regular job and I would go on jobs. And it was often a suggestion that if I cut my dreads, I could probably um, get a job. And then when we came, when I came out here and I started Black Westchester, the way some of even our local elected officials and leaders looked at me with the dreads, who now respect me now that I don't have it and it has nothing to do with them. It just, I just decided to change. Um, it's it's just the way they looked at me, the way they took me serious, the way they people judged me a certain way um, with, with the dreads. And, you know, they were well-groomed. They wasn't just wild and out of control and everything. So, I mean, I, I've experienced that as well. Um, and what I if they were wild that. and out of control, though? What does that have to well, do no, with No, 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 but I'm just saying, I'm just saying they couldn't even complain about that. You know what I'm saying? It was well kept, but yeah. but it was just like certain people would be like, it doesn't you know, impact your brain you're, though. That's the, that's what I'm saying is right, that like right, how you bring your hair might, you might does not further. impact your brain. <laughs> right, you might go further if you cut your dreads. Like like I've often been told that. Like as a suggestion, I, I had a pastor in Atlanta tell me, well, you think that your hair might be you know preventing you from getting some of these jobs? Like he asked me that question, and I was like, um, you know. I, Decided that wasn't the church I wanted to be a part of anymore. <laughs> um, but <laughs> go ahead, Bob. I just wanted to throw that out because you were talking about the hair, and I've experienced that. But uh, Dr. Bob, yeah, I just wanted to add that with respect to the significance of the current composition of the court and um, what is at stake. I think one of the things that we need to be reminded of is that even though judges do uh, seek to follow uh, the rule of legal impartiality. Um, when we actually look at it, um, they are oftentimes steeped in um, distinctive judicial traditions. And uh, the current composition of the court, uh, clearly um, in favor of conservatives, uh, conservatives, um, jurists who have gone through one of, in my judgment, one of the more extreme forms of uh, legal education and, and I probably more, more accurately, a kind of legal philosophy. Um, as Solange and Tamika and other followers of the court know, um, many of the justices who make up the majority conservative wing of the court um, follow a principle we often call original construction, originalism, you know, literalism, something of that kind, which seeks to return us back to, um, a, I would say, a pre-New Deal era um, conception of the role of the court as um, um, as having a minimal impact. Indeed, one of the reasons why this is for me, and I'm sure um, for all our jurists out there and anyone else who's um, attuned to these issues, one thing that's especially alarming has been the repudiation of the principle of stare decisis, which um, establishes that Supreme Court previous Supreme Court rulings have to serve as a precedent, um, and um, the justices on the conservative wing have increasingly um, voiced um, yeah, lack of commitment to that longstanding principle. I know that I, I think I was listening to something where Clarence Thomas, the, the interpretation was um, Justice Thomas was basically saying, look, forget, forget um, precedent, you know, I am going to make rulings that are consistent with um, my judicial philosophy. And so, you know, that's it's a funny, concern. During their fun. nomination hearings, though, they're mm -hmm. all for stare decisis. They right, all right. say that they will follow history. And it, it's a it's a intellectual um, respect issue that those who walked before them gave those rulings some significant consideration. 
Um, so it's interesting to see it now. And, and maybe that's part of the reform that needs to happen on these courts is that we need to look at what happens, you know, 10 years later, or, you know, is there any type of check and balance, you know, that we go through, we go through everything else, the, the Congress, the president, but there's no kind of check on what happens once they sail through their nominations. And um, that might be something that that we, we need to consider. I wanna just address one thing about what you talked about the ideological, because I, I really feel like there is this growing ideological dogma that's happening on um, sort of the more liberal side of the court. And, I, and I'm gonna throw Justice Roberts over there for a second too, mm -hmm. because Justice Roberts, sometimes he's a conservative, but sometimes he's not quite right. conservative. So he might be sort of our Justice Kennedy in, in, in some of the growing cases, but there's this ideological dogma that's that's growing from these LGBTQ civil rights, QI um, civil rights cases that says that there's, there is some legal connection between harm and humiliation where we must treat people equally and respect their, any differences that they may have. And that's how these rulings are coming down. And, and we, we listen to what's happening um, in Florida and other parts of the country on where they're, they're saying that you can't teach children something that's going to cause them to feel bad about themselves. And, and I really feel like these cases are sort of a, a, a Pandora's box surprise for us <laughs> to bring a whole slew of cases against all the things that happen in these schools that cause our children harm, the hair cases, the how you look cases, your name cases. How many of us know of somebody in the class? I, I grew up, you know, my name was Solange and I had teachers that were like, I can't pronounce that. And my father was a very large man, very strong man. He was a builder. And um, in kindergarten, when the teacher asked him, well, does she have a nickname? He says, yes, Solange. <laughs> and like, and from there, right? But um, I really feel like those, they, they're, they're opening these, these doors that we need to get in there and start exploiting to show the ludicrousy and the ridiculousness of them and, and not teaching certain parts of history because it might offend people. And I want to say, if you don't teach my kid history, accurate history, that's offensive to them, right? So that they don't understand all the things that happen, all the barriers that they that their parents have had to overcome and their forefathers have had to overcome just so that my kid can be in a school that has white kids in it and other kids in it. So I, I feel like these, these, these states are opening up these doors and we're gonna see these slew of cases that come before the Supreme Court that are gonna go against their, you know, their, what they're trying to do, but open the door for us. And this harm and humiliation sort of ideological theory that the court is starting to weave, I really feel like we're gonna to start to see a lot more about that in the coming years. It's, you know, it's, girl, it's, it's funny when you say that, you know, all this book burning and all of this stuff about harm, how much stuff that have we been taught that was uncomfortable to us or harmful to us? And I mean, for for hundreds of years, for years and years and years, um, when was that ever considered? When, when was that ever part of the conversation? You know, I, I just, you know, I find that, you know, hypocritical. When I hear I'll, I'll jump in and um, I agree. AJ and Solange, you hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's as if only a certain group is impacted. So if you teach about, okay, so the pilgrims came in this year <laughs> and then they interacted with the indigenous people. And then at some point there were people who came from Africa, but they weren't slaves. They just wanted to come to the United States and they worked a little bit. That's okay because you can continue to teach about the pilgrims. You can continue to teach about our indi indigenous brothers and sisters. But the moment you start speaking about 1619 and on, that's an issue. There, in schools, and this is what schools are often doing, they teach about the pilgrims coming, indigenous, then additional immigrants coming. And I had to ask, I said, well, 
my family has been in the United States since the late 1600s. I, I know that. I know my family, but that was nowhere. So I said, is that segment, is that missing? Do, do we not matter? And I said, what you just said, Solange, we have to bring these cases and say, well, you know what, we're armed. So if they can say that, you know, you're making my child feel bad, you know, you're placing blame and no one is placing blame on a child who's sitting in class based upon what their ancestors, you know, may have done. But you sure want to place blame on those of us who are, you know, the children, you know, of the formerly enslaved. You want to make us feel less than, so I agree with you. We need to continue to do it that. And AJ, in terms of the hair, there are many of us in salons, you may know that, yes, men, Black men go through certain things when they're practicing attorneys if they wear natural hair. Mm -hmm. It's a little different if you are a Black woman and you wear Absolutely. the hair. Absolutely. Yet I have colleagues who for years, they have not felt comfortable. And Dr. Bob knows my hair is natural. I will throw crochet braids in there. I will do anything, wear it out curly. Uh, some people just are not comfortable. And I always say, even if I straighten my hair, that's not changing me and it's going to change soon and curl up. Right. So it's it's as if you want me to be something or someone that I can never be. Right. You know? right. But I'm, t I'm telling you, AJ, I, I thank you for making that point. But Black female attorneys, Black women attorneys, many of us, have major issues with feeling comfortable enough to wear our hair natural. I've been practicing 22 years. Solange has been practicing 30. So it's not an issue for me. That's right. But those yeah, after a certain point, we just, we get over it and we, we realize yeah, it's not about our hair, right? I'm, I'm, I've known people in my family who have felt that they had to wear their hair certain ways in corporate settings that was not who they were. You know what I'm saying? But the, but to move up in that setting, they felt that that's, you know, whether you agree or not, that they felt that that's how they had to to, to, to navigate that that situation. So, I mean, I've had that in my in my family yeah. directly. And so that's I, unfortunate. That's really unfortunate. And this is a good time as we bring up our children to really, you know, um, I, 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 I fall on the, the side of parenting where you, you hear parents that say like, oh, they shouldn't get the trophy for, for participation or whatever. And I fall on the side that, no, our children, they need that. They need that affirmation. You wake up every day, you tell your, you tell your kids they're beautiful. You tell your kid in utero that they're smart and they're, they're, they're fun and they're, they're good people to be around. But more importantly, you tell them that you are beautiful. And my kids will tell you, they, this kills my kids because I'll say, you know, like, oh, your mom is hot. Right. And they and they laugh about it, too. Right. And, but but this, here's the reality. If our kids don't hear that from us about us, they're not going to believe it about themselves. Right. So wear are your dreads? If you if that's what you know, you feel the best and you feel like you are at your pinnacle, wear your your dreads, because there's some young brother out there right now who's going to be Ph.D. professor doctor, lawyer, engineer, it's in his head. And, and he needs to know when he sees you that, that he, you know, it, right. you can do it and, and he can do it too. And you, right. if anybody see my son with the crazy hair, it's always an argument, you know, with the older people in my family, when's he going to cut his hair? And it's like, it's not about his hair. You know, my kids are all brilliant and they're beautiful. And if he wants to walk out here with wild hair, then I won't let him walk out here with wild so, so hair. Let me, so let me set the record straight. So I, I never cut my hair because of pressure. Okay. Um, you know, I was starting over over here, no money at all. Um, it was starting to get expensive to take care of it too. Uh, one, one, and and my wife, uh, my ex-wife now, um, was my in-house stylist. She designed my, she did it all and everything like that. And that was the one thing still connecting us. And one day I just felt like I was just cutting her out of my life and I cut my hair. So like literally that's what that was about. So, our <laughs> hair for women though, our hair is so, you know, it's, so, so, that, that, it's so, so that's what it's about. And I, and I, you know, for sorry, those of us who have hair trauma. It would, be down, it would be down here now. 
You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know if I want to go through all of that to start it over. I do know I want to do something natural with my hair. I don't know what I want to do. I'm, all of this, I'm trying all of, I don't know what I want to do right we'll now. We'll do another so, segment just I'm on how to do, do black hair. Right, right. I'm So I'm going to go through all kinds of transformations. Y'all going to see, like, what is he doing there? I, I'm not sure. But I'm just going to let it be natural. Um, 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 we got another segment coming up, but is there anything else you want to say about our nominee, why she should be in, um, anything about her, anything? Um, she is highly qualified. All of the nominees were highly qualified. Yes. She's going to rock it when she gets onto this court. We should be honored. It is our blessing to see this woman, this qualified Supreme Woman nominated for the U.S. Supreme Court. We look forward to years and years and years. Our children and grandchildren are going to see this nominee as a, as a U.S. Supreme Court justice, and they're going to see that there's somebody that looks like them on the court. And it is our blessing and our honor to see her um, ascend to that level. And I will just add, it's been more than time for a Black woman to be on the United States Supreme Court. We have constantly had to prove ourselves. We have been the backbone. We will push everyone else forward. And all we want is to be given an opportunity and have people support us. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is intelligent. She is intelligent. She was confirmed for the district court, for the court. So it's as if, well, what's, what are they going to make up now? What are they going to make up now? They want to look at her LSAT scores. LSAT has nothing to do with how great of a judge you are going to be. So let and us they, and they do that. Too. And they do that it's with Kavanaugh. They do that with Kavanaugh and, and that and that woman. They just put that. But I remember, never heard. things are different when a black woman. Yeah, That's right. Yes. You know, comes yes. to the game. So the nominee. Do you remember your LSAT score? I mean, I took no, the LSAT back I, in I, I 1988. I don't. I mean, <laughs> that was a long time ago. Somebody else. Interesting. I mean, we have a question from Fred. Um, who's watching through YouTube. Mm -hmm. He said, do you think the confirmation process is going to be rough? No. Yes. I'm sorry. I think it's going to be and, rough and, because and, they're going to be ugly. Uh -huh. You think it's going to be ugly? They're going to attempt, but Justice Katanji Brown, Judge yeah, Katanji yeah. Brown, she's not justice on the Supreme Court yet. She is going to hold her own and be as poised right. as she always has been. That's right. I, yeah. I think it might, you and, know, um, they might try to make it ugly, but we know how to rise above that. Yes. And at the end of the day, do you want to be the you know, do you want to be a Senate, uh, a senator who voted against a black woman, the first black woman to be nominated to U.S. Supreme Court? Because trust me, we are going to run with that in every state, in every election. Every black woman will be out there knocking on doors if this this nomination does not go through. And you don't want to be that senator to have black women against you. Dr. Bob. Yeah, I was... Um... I was going to say that um, I've never heard um, LSAT scores come up before in any that's judicial ridiculous. hearing. And it seems that's like silly. asking your PPA. Yeah, yeah, that's silly. It'd be like asking me for my GRE scores right, instead right. of what, what scholarship. You, they're doing have. away with all those tests anyway. So. Right. You're real, and, and I think if there's any possibility for um, controversy, it has to be with particular rulings. I was curious to know if you all are aware of any rulings that you think really um, might draw fire from the more conservative senators who will seek to make her judicial You know how the point of her rule is? The fact that a Black woman is going to be walking in and sitting at that table, that is going to be enough for them. They've already tried to attack her. And you know what? She has the evidence. She has the receipts. She has her Harvard diploma. She has yeah. her Harvard degree from from I mean her her juris doctorate from Harvard. So um, and you know there's not too many senators that can say they don't even have, no senator has the credentials that she has. So you're correct, and I just want to say this, Dr. Bob Solange is on point, but this is where they will attempt to attack her. I believe because she was that public defender, right. and people always like to ask me and. Well, how do you do that? Why didn't you recuse yourself? Why would you represent that person? Not that everyone who is accused of a crime has the right to a zealous advocate. You know, there are two sides, but I believe they are going to attack her on that alone. They didn't do that with a prosecutor, but they will do that with her, but she is going to be prepared. 
let's see what happens. And I, I, I have a tremendous respect for those that practice criminal law. I, I my practice is solely on um, representing uh, children in, in immigration court and um, and and in their filings. Um, and that's my my volunteer work outside of my job job. Um, but occasionally I venture into the criminal uh, area because they have you know some small problem or something. So I have tremendous respect for criminal lawyers. They get up every single day and defend people's right to be treated fairly and to have a just uh, you know hearing and trial. And and I absolutely admire that. Thank you so tremendously. Much. Um, you. Last words. I see my new my guests for the seven o'clock hour are here. Uh, last words. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for affording us this opportunity. And the next time we speak on air, Justice Katanji Brown Jackson will right. be on the United States. Amen, Supreme Court. sister. So thank you. Tamika, it's been an honor to talk with you. And Andrew, Dr. Bob, we need to go the whole thing on PhDs because that's something tremendous in itself. So, well, yeah, that's a whole nother conversation you're right. <laughs> um, But listen, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you both on the show, and we appreciate you sharing your uh, legal insights with us and our audience and kind of walking through us through what we're likely to um, see in the coming weeks during the nomination hearings. Thank um, you. Have a good gotta night. Go, gotta go, but maybe we can schedule something for after she's confirmed as Absolutely. a follow-up or something. And, that sounds and great. Thank you. Right. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Wonderful. Good yes, night. Well, have a good evening.